How does the property investment as an asset class compare to other investment options in terms of risk and return? Uh, I think focusing on real estate, I think it's uh, doubtless to say that um, you know the brains here in the market, you, you probably are better analysts than I am. Uh, but just to focus on it as an asset class, which I think is still a very, there's a case for investment in property. What I'm going to do is maybe give you a few useful information based on the um, old mutual or at least privileged information, which I'll try to share. Uh, but based on the old mutual portfolio, uh, the portfolio itself being probably the largest single entity owned property portfolio, uh, we're talking of um, um, just over half a billion in terms of valuation, market value, that is for the portfolio itself, close to a million square meters uh, in terms of letable space. Uh, so I think it's fairly representative of the Zimbabwean property market. But property itself is an asset class. Uh, just looking at the statistics over the last five years, whether you're looking at it globally uh, and then coming to Zimbabwe itself, whether you're looking at it regionally uh, and then coming to Zimbabwe itself globally, um, property has been appreciating in terms of value. If you look at the specific markets, on average, um, uh, statistics from uh, OECD, that's an organization for economic development and cooperation. It's one of, um, it's a grouping of, um, uh, you know, about 30 or so economies. Uh, they show that on average, real estate uh, has appreciated over the last five years by about 22%. Uh, and when you split it into specific markets, um, the appreciation is different and varied, but even higher, whether you take Europe, uh, you know, around 25%, you take America, it's around 30%. You take the emerging markets in which we fall in as Africa, we are somewhere there around, um, you know, 30%. You come to Africa itself as a region, again, the trend is the same. Now, specific to Zimbabwe, where we don't have much of that information, because generally we don't like to share, but you know, borrowing from the uh, old mutual portfolio itself, in local currency terms, uh, you know, we do track the, the portfolio itself in local currency terms for the past five years. Uh, that portfolio has performed in terms of capital return and uh, when we look at total return, that is your rental income and capital appreciation, it is actually appreciated and has performed above inflation for the past five years. Uh, 2022 and 2023 property, looking at our portfolio, um, it performed above the all, uh, all share index. Uh, so it just gives you a, you know, a case for property as an asset class, uh, just to see that um, uh, you know, there is really a case to invest in there. Um, maybe for now I'll pause here and then I'll share a bit more detail and a bit more twist to it. Um, thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, as well for the insights about the, our biggest property investor in Zimbabwe. And if the portfolio is gained by such a margin, uh, it means there's scope for property investment. Um, moving on, um, my neighbor. Um, what trends are you seeing in the property market in terms of demand, supply, and pricing? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doc. Uh, so we, I think it would be prudent uh, for me to give um, at least an overview uh, in terms of uh, the performance of uh, the various use classes uh, because uh, the performance um, is then uh, shaping the, the trend and uh, obviously the pricing. Uh, but I'll try to focus uh, maybe on two aspects, uh, namely the uh, commercial side and the industrial side. So on the commercial side, when we look in the CBD, uh, we have seen uh, very high voids, uh, especially within the office uh, use class, uh, voids uh, of uh, between 40 to 60 percent. And an interesting trend is that uh, the voids are actually um, in the upper floors, uh, especially of uh, the high-rise building. And um, what we have seen uh, landlords doing uh, has been um, a, a repurposing or a shift uh, in terms of uh, the uh, traditional uses of the spaces. 
So they've actually moved towards um, uh, much uh, smaller spaces, uh, obviously to also accommodate uh, the small and medium enterprises. Uh, but when we also look at uh, the retail um, uh, use within the CBD, we have seen a paradigm shift uh, from the traditionally larger spaces uh, to smaller uh, cubicles. And uh, I think um, uh, I know of a case uh, where uh, one of uh, the retailers uh, has been actually chased or uh, has had uh, their lease terminated uh, by the landlord uh, to accommodate uh, for repurposing of uh, the space into you know, much uh, smaller spaces. So the trend that we've seen uh, is um, a movement or a preference towards uh, much uh, smaller spaces, uh, which would obviously command uh, higher rentals uh, on the basis of the quantum reduction. So you find that for smaller spaces of uh, below 50 square meters within the retail section, they're actually commanding about um, uh, $50, an uh, average of $50, uh, or so per square meter. So what um, this is, uh, the, the, the overall effect is that um, even as um, REITs are coming into play, you also see that uh, there might be also preferences by investors in, um, in REITs to also be inclined towards uh, the much, um, I mean, bigger spaces, but partitioned or subdivided to accommodate, uh, you know, those um, uh, smaller uses. But uh, also an interesting trend, especially within the suburban, has been uh, the development of um, uh, retail, uh, retail uh, shopping malls or complexes, uh, especially along the strategic uh, transport nodes. Um, I think we've also seen uh, Tigere uh, coming in strong in that space uh, by putting up uh, quite a number of uh, shopping malls. Uh, then also coming back again, I think within the uh, the, the 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 challenge of uh, you know I avoid uh, rates within the CBD. I think we've also had a read uh, coming also into that space, uh, revitas in terms of uh, identifying um, you know buildings uh, with uh, I voids and trying to repurpose uh, those buildings uh, to leverage on um, on, on that um, uh, opportunity. I think I'll pause for now, then uh, allow the, the discussion to, to continue. Thank you. Thank you. In, in, interesting um, that we have the smaller spaces being preferred. So I'm just wondering what is happening to the bigger retailers? Is there scope for them? But anyway, we'll come back to that. Uh, Mr. Mende, I haven't forgotten you. I, is your team ready? Yep, the presentation is ready. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we were asked to make like a presentation. Uh, so if you can bear with me, I'm going to take a little bit of time just walking you through this. Um, my name is Chester Mende, which has been uh, introduced earlier. Uh, I am with uh, Shelter Incorporated. Our business is real estate. Uh, we are into housing, uh, the living. Uh, through Shelter Zimbabwe and uh, housing the, uh, in the afterlife, which is Itosha uh, Gardens. We've been in this business for the last 43 years. Uh, what we uh, are looking at is unlocking debt equity in, in housing. Um, and our discussion is uh, um, provoking uh, debate on um, uh, existing housing stock. Uh, we all know that um, uh, Zimbabwe is awash with um, housing that are uh, uh, sprouting everywhere, uh, and these houses um, uh, are all being built for cash. And the obvious question that accompanies that is, uh, uh, is it wise that uh, this uh, should be the case? Shouldn't there be something done by the capital markets? Uh, to unlock the cash that is uh, sitting in all these houses. Uh, the next one is, uh, I'm talking about leveraging uh, housing to promote uh, savings. 
It kind of sounds related to the first one, but slightly different. Uh, we are talking about new housing stock, uh, and we are saying uh, in an economy where savings uh, is uh, much needed, uh, is there an, uh, some kind of uh, uh, instrument that can be uh, structured for uh, promoting uh, servings uh, through housing? Uh, and the, we make an appeal or a suggestion that uh, perhaps uh, there is need to discuss uh, uh, a resuscitating uh, mortgage uh, market. Uh, and finally, um, we see the real estate business uh, is now anyone and everybody. Uh, we heard Mike talk of himself as a builder. I could do the same. I'm a builder. Uh, but we will find pension funds and, and banks have also become builders. Uh, and one is saying, what exactly is this industry about? Uh, you know, is there no benefits uh, in focusing? So, um, the, on, on debt equity, um, I have um, uh, alluded to this, um, uh, where we are saying, um, what, what can we do there uh, to unlock the value? I will not bore you with too much detail. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, I'm sure my slide will be shared. Um, the, what we are suggesting as uh, solutions is, um, uh, you know, uh, according to the latest, um, uh, uh, you know, monetary policy statement by the Reserve Bank, uh, the uh, loan deposit ratio uh, in banking is at 49.27%. Uh, you know, financial institutions uh, might want to uh, lend out a little bit more. Uh, I was talking to a sister yesterday, uh, and uh, she, like many, are saying, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Um, we are not uh, bankers, uh, or you will obviously understand better. We are simply provoking discussion on that. Um, uh, a few financial institutions which are offering mortgage finances might need to relax terms. Uh, again, it's a provocation. We are not experts. Please don't throw stones at us. Uh, um, you know, you will obviously know better. We are hoping that some of these provocations are material for uh, food for thought. Um, and uh, in a nutshell, we are proposing, uh, you, know, a, 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 you know, various uh, uh, instruments uh, like mortgages, uh, home equity loans, and uh, the like. Uh, on leveraging housing, um, again, uh, you know, I, I, I think I've uh, uh, I talked about what this is all about. Uh, we are building housing at the moment, houses at the moment, uh, and we are saying, um, uh, can we, uh, you know, see some. Um, uh, uh, activity uh, by uh, investors with some instrument uh, that can exploit the opportunities in this area. Uh, we were talking to a, a, a financial organization not so long ago, and they were talking of an electronic, uh, you know, trading platform uh, where uh, you have um, the market uh, coming in and out. Uh, and, uh, you know, creating uh, funds uh, for um, building houses uh, and those that, uh, you know, um, uh, need to store their value, they'll come in and those that need uh, to come out for whatever reason, they'll uh, trade out. Uh, but, uh, you know, this again is um, something that is in the melting pot. Um, uh, like I say, we have discussed it and we have left it uh, with those in the know to look at um, uh, what what they can do. Uh, but for us, we are saying there is stock. Um, and we heard this morning about um, uh, the accumulation uh, from, uh, you know, um, uh, diaspora remittances uh, in, in, the, in the amount of $3 billion. Uh, it's obviously w what is sitting in this stock uh, in these houses. Uh, and we are saying how do we unlock that value so that it comes into production? Uh, resuscitating mortgages. Uh, we, we are quite passionate about this uh, because uh, my company, which is uh, a, a, a developer, has become a, a, a bank. 
uh, we now have got a sizable portfolio uh, where we are lending uh, to people on terms. Uh, and it's not our business. We know nothing about this business. Uh, uh, and all we are doing at the moment is uh, we are saying we've got uh, a, a data book, um, which other people would give it a, a, a better name uh, and would do better with it. And we're saying, can something be done about that so that we can uh, take our money and use it for something else? Uh, in our company, um, it might be small numbers, I don't know, but you're looking at anything between five and $10 million that we have, uh, we're sitting on uh, at any given time uh, in our data book. Uh, and you know, we can do uh, more buildings with that five, $10 million uh, if we had the cash. Uh, and here we have just made a few suggestions. There used to be the National Housing Guarantee uh, we've discussed this with the Public Services Commission. Uh, you know, there used to be the National Housing Guarantee Fund. We've discussed this with the Ministry of um, uh, National Housing and Ministry of Local Government. And we're saying, uh, you know, the capital market, can't you pick this up uh, and uh, revive these instruments uh, so that we can get going somewhere? Uh, we haven't got the capacity to sit down with Public Services Commission and they arrange a $10 million facility for us uh, so that we can build houses for civil servants. It can be better done by uh, uh, yourselves in um, this industry uh, of uh, the financing. I spoke about uh, resuscitating mortgages. I won't go much into that. I think I've already said enough about it. Um, Technology now is letting me down. Is there anything else? Okay. Um, uh, we spoke about uh, core functionalities. Um, I think each and every one of us in this room will know of um, a big brother in, uh, that has gone in, into a housing estate and it has gone bad on them. Uh, and we are saying, uh, should they continue to do that? Are they not wasting capital there? Are uh, they not better off partnering with us? Uh, we like to think we know a thing or two about this uh, so that their money can be better spent. Um, uh, so we are encouraging uh, the, the, the financial uh, industry uh, to exploit um, our uh, core functionalities, we think, to the benefit of everybody uh, in, the, in the market. I think I will rest uh, my case there, Mike. Thank you very much. The attendees have acknowledged the level of uh, sharing that you've done. We now know more about uh, Shelter Freak, but above that, Shelter Zimbabwe, shelter Zimbabwe rather, rather. And we, you have given us insight into the residential sector, the non availability of mortgages which is quite, um, quite a challenge, which is a huge opportunity for a mortgage REIT um, that could be formed. And um, we hope somewhere along the way, uh, we have some who will come up with that structure for you, which should actually unlock value for you. But uh, enough about the property market. Yes, Chester has shared about the residential. We have, um, Stephen has shared about um, the, uh, the real estate is an investment class which is actually outperforming others. Then Darlington is said about the commercial and industrial. I can't keep boring our attendees on the same subject, but now I'll go to the chairman's special invite. Uh, I invited Chenge um, as a special um, to assist and share with us what are EFTs and uh, what are the benefits um, that let me just look at the question that I just presented for you. What are the bene key benefits of EFTs uh, compared to traditional mutual funds and how are they transforming the investment landscape? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike. I feel quite lonely up here. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think like Mike has said, um, I'm, I was invited to be part of this panel because if you look at the topic, uh, it was talking about ETFs and REITs, but then I think the panelists realized that um, the panel was uh, full of uh, people probably with uh, more knowledge regarding the real estate space. 
But you tend to understand why these two probably were combined because ETFs and REITs uh, were established uh, almost under the same as statutory instrument. They are both um, established under the CIS uh, Act. So they are governed by the CIS Act and they are both listed, which means they also report to the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange through the listing, the listing um, uh, re regulations. But just to give a brief background of um, what has really transpired regarding this market. So we had the first uh, ETF uh, on the 4th of January 2021, which was a top 10 uh, ETF. Uh, then later on, we had uh, the next ETF coming on board uh, January or February 2022, 20, which was the Morgan and Co. Um, our financial sector uh, ETF. Then later on in the year, mid-year, with the Dad Vest. Then later on, Morgan again. And uh, lastly, the Casado um, um, Agriculture uh, ETF. So we, we, have, we now have five uh, ETFs uh, on, on board. The, the benefits, now coming back to your question to say what are the benefits and how are they different from your mutual funds. So mutual funds, we are looking at uh, uh, your unity trust. Uh, there are so many similarities in terms of the establishment, in terms of the key players. There's a fund manager, there's a trustee. Um, there are quite a lot of um, uh, similarities. But the major uh, difference is that uh, ETFs are listed and unit trusts are not listed. That's where you, you have a difference. And then the second major difference is that um, ETFs are established under a certain theme. Uh, whereas unity trusts, you can buy and sell as and when uh, you want. You don't really have to, to specify which kind of counters you want to buy. If you want to sell Barclays and replace Barclays with uh, a counter in the agriculture sector, you can do that under, under unit trust. But in an ETF, you have to define your theme and you have to define how you are going to be tracking that theme and what the underlying um, uh, index will be. So those are some of the major uh, departing points between your mutual funds and your, um, and your ETFs. Um, the transparency in terms of what you are holding uh, also comes into, into, into play. Regarding the benefits uh, for investing into ETFs, um, the... the, the the most important uh, benefit would be the issue of um, efficiency uh, that it brings to uh, especially your retail investors. Because if you're a retail investor, it's very difficult to sometimes diversify your portfolio. Because when you go to a broker, a broker will tell you that my minimum is probably $100 or maybe 100 shares or something like that. So if you have $100, it means you can only buy one stock. But with an ETF now, it enables you to get exposure to more than just one stock with the same hundred dollars because you, you now buy units into a fund that is holding on to a number of um, uh, a number of um, uh, a number of stocks. So th that's that's really the major benefit uh, of uh, ETFs because the, that element of uh, diversification. But then the other benefit, which unfortunately. Uh, some of us who, who we have been passionate about ETFs have not seen that particular benefit come to fruition. Is that um, ETFs, the, the, the most exciting part is to do with um, what you call in kind creations and redemptions. Th that, that's, that's really probably one of the most exciting parts of having ETFs on board. But unfortunately, it has not been really, really active. One, because I think it's an issue of uh, liquidity. And uh, also, yeah, so it has been liquidity on the part of uh, turnover on the market and liquidity also on the part of even the stocks that are, that are being traded. So by in-kind redemptions and, um, and um, um, creations, you are now taking advantage of the, um, the mismatch between your unit price of the ETF and the NAV of the, the ETF. At it, 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 any given time, you'll find that those two will not be the same. So the, the, good, thing, the good thing about ETFs is that um, when, even when the market is going down, it will give the market activity because people will be trying to take advantage of that mismatch. 
and then if the NAV is low and your market value is up, you, 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 you then play in the market to make sure so that the ETFs are created in such a way that it is a self-correcting mechanism. Over time, that NAV and the market value will come to, to very close to each other. But then as the market trades, you will find differences and then people play that. But unfortunately, the activity there has been very low. Uh, we have been overseeing uh, an ETF uh, since 2021, but the number of uh, creations and redemptions that uh, that we have seen, yeah, they have been quite a number, but not the kind of level and the kind of participation that we thought uh, it would um, it would um, 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 sort of um, uh, create. Then uh, even the brokers themselves, we didn't see the level of stampede that we expected uh, in in trying to register as market makers. So that has really been probably the downside in terms of uh, the ETS. But otherwise, generally, uh, it's a product that has been uh, accepted by the market and also ex a product that we, we expect to grow. And uh, lastly, uh, Mike, one also other disappointing thing about ETF so far is that if you look at all the five ETFs, the underlying uh, instrument is the same. It's your listed equities. Whereas ETFs can be, they can be about anything. We can have a commodity-based, a bond-based ETF. Um, there was also talk about uh, an ESG-based uh, uh, ETF and things like that. So the unfortunate bit is that uh, so far, all the five ETFs that we have on the market have the same underlying, uh, underlying, um, underlying uh, assets. Whereas we would expect that ETFs should expand and then bring uh, other, other instruments. There was talk about a bond market that is not developing. Probably as the bond market develops, we should also expect to see an ETFs that is combining quite a number of bonds and then listed uh, probably on VFX, on ZSE, depends on where the bond market is, uh, is going. Uh, but otherwise, um, I hope I have responded to your question, Mike. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. What I'm happy about is that you actually eventually shared opportunities that are available that will, I'm sure will benefit um, the, those who are attending. Uh, I have benefited a lot as well in, in getting the clarification of what an ETF is. Uh, but, but still with you, you're my favorite. How do ETFs impact market efficiency and liquidity? And what are the implications for, for investors? Just if you could share that with us, who surely make a, a decision to be investing in ETFs. Yeah, so I, I touched on that a bit as I was uh, explaining. I think probably my answer was a bit too long and, and winding. But uh, when, you took up, when you look at uh, liquidity, um, the liquidity comes in through all those. But you find that our market is small and... Uh, the behavior of the market players is such that at one time there is um, so much excitement. The market is going up and everyone wants to buy. You have all these um, uh, webinars going online. Um, the, the Twitter, uh, almost every day you have uh, uh, some, some space uh, talking about uh, ZSE and things like that. Then there's a time when the market is almost dead. Nothing is happening. So that, that's really where you need your ETFs to bring about that activity at any given time because people will still take positions, um, taking advantage of the mismatches. And um, also looking at um, uh, the, the liquidity, the, the impact that uh, the market liquidity will have on the development of ETFs is that uh, when you are creating a basket, I talked about in-kind creations and redemptions. When you are creating a basket, you have to create the basket in the same ways as prescribed by that particular ETF. So if you have, uh, like in the case of the top 10 ETF, if you have um, um, probably illiquid stocks, like your, maybe your BAT or your CFI uh, in that, in that uh, top 10, it then means that uh, when someone is trying to do the in-kind creation, they won't be able to buy those stocks. And as long as you can't buy one or two stocks that are in the basket, then you can't deliver that basket to the, to the, to the fund manager. So in terms of the impact on liquidity, um, the impact on liquidity of ETFs 
also speaks to the level or the general level of liquidity of the market. But otherwise, ETFs in general, they are supposed to bring about uh, excitement and then liquidity and um, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the market uh, generally. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, th th thanks, Yenge. You, you've done justice to my confidence in you articulating on ATMs. Now, uh, before we start talking something else, do we have any questions? Thank you. Thanks very much, sister. Right. Uh, interesting. ETFs, REITs, any questions uh, about this? It's getting to the end of the day, Mike. Eh? People, are, people are starting to. Uh... All right, guys. Uh, let's. Okay, Mike, continue going, and then we'll see what happens. We have no, okay. more. I've given you another 50, uh, 10 minutes, so go for it. Um, just to share with you, uh, thanks to our organizers, the the Zim Int, um, they actually gave me an opportunity to be sharing about REITs. So every Friday edition, you always find um, more about REITs. So take the opportunity, grab the previous papers, and uh, read, and understand more, and um, prepare your reads along the way. Yeah. And um, I, you know, what, what I like about reads is that, as you know, Zimbabweans like two things: they like property and they like cars. <laughs> I think uh, above all things else. So at least a read allows you to invest in the underlying asset without having to own the individual stock, mm -hmm. um, which is of course important because now you have a basket of assets which are in that sector which you can then invest in. So it's a very good product and I think it, it speaks to what Justin and me have we've been talking about for years. This is about how to stimulate retail investors. I think one of Justin's biggest uh, Biggest K, K, KPIs, and he's been is up there for the last couple of years. Is how can we move retail investors who are now at what 0 0.00 something, right on the market? How many retail? What's the percentage of retail investors? If, if, if you talk about the number of trades, probably about ten to fifteen percent. Ten to fifteen percent. That's not bad. You see, so it's it's building up slowly. Um, but if you look at other markets, of course, retail investors are a huge slice of it, and it's important to get retail investors, you and me, basically trading on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange and the VFX, which of course is in US dollars. It's a perfect medium if, if we all have US dollars, as the minister says, apart from me, of course, I have no US dollars. Right, yeah, Mike. Uh, Stephen, following your presentation about um, the uh, real estate uh, asset class, I want, if you can further explain, what are the benefits and drawbacks of investing in REITs versus direct property investment? Um, so, Again, I think um, I think to a large extent you touched on that uh, in terms of the benefits when you did your presentation, and uh, Andy has just spoken about it. Um, and I'm sure the you know the brains here have a very good understanding of those uh, benefits. I mean, you know the advantages and disadvantages. I could, you know, there there are several of them. I could just go to town. I could just pick one and go to town on it. I mean, like Andy, you've just spoken about the ability to, you know, diversify and, you know, have without really investing directly in the underlying asset itself because there are, you know, there are challenges that come with direct ownership of the actual asset itself. Um, I could go to town on that alone. Um, if you look at the current you, you touched a little bit on it. If you look at the current setup of our um, legislation uh, or the acts that govern real estate, uh, real estate unfortunately transcends almost all aspects uh, and all parts of people's lives. There are over hundreds in Zimbabwe alone. Unlike other jurisdictions, you would have what we call a consolidated act that governs real estate. You've got over 100 uh, pieces of legislation in the form of either X or statutory instrument that touch on the actual asset itself as a real estate asset. I don't think you want to be bogged down in all those administrative issues uh, in owning that. A REIT gives you that advantage. You, you own the underlying asset, but you don't necessarily have the headaches of you know, all these other troubles of the, you know, the laws that govern and uh, the actual asset, you leave that to experts like myself 
uh, and others in this room. So we manage that. You have things like your Rod Act that touches on your real estate. You have the Zesa Act that touches on your. You have the the Post and Telecoms Act. You have uh, SIs on exchange. You have all this that touch on the. You leave those headaches to us. You just own, uh, you know, um, your asset through a REIT, which gives you that advantage. Obviously, there are others that I could speak about. Liquidity is another. Real estate is known to be an illiquid asset. Uh, this gives you the ability to, you know, uh, fairly comparatively more liquid asset. Uh, on the flip side, there are also other advantages for owning the actual asset itself. It's a tangible asset. We've heard of non-tangible assets dematerialized. I had the term for the first time here. But real estate is a tangible asset for those that want to be very conservative. Uh, Zimbabweans are known, like Andy have just uh, said, if you own your piece of property, uh, the first thing that we do is put a boundary wall around it just to you know, emphasize the fact that it's mine, I own it. This is my place. This is So for those that are very conservative, um, you actually own that. It's a tangible asset. You have greater control of it in terms of what you would like. You can lease it. You can turn it into whatever you want. You, you know, it's an asset. Unlike these other non-tangible assets, you own them on a piece of paper. Uh, I own a piece of paper that says I'm holding shares somewhere that are listed on the stock exchange that I probably don't have control in as much control as I would like, maybe, in terms of what happens to the share price and things like that. Here is a piece of property. It's tangible. I own it. I can sort of determine within limits what I want for it in terms of the rent, the return that I want. So, so they're all varied. I could just go to town on any of the aspects that we touched on property. If I had more time uh, and if I wasn't abusing you after lunch, I would definitely have gone to town about it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, you managed to take us to town. <laughs> and, and thank you for taking us there. Um, now, uh, Darlington, how do you think risk can impact the property market in terms of liquidity and price discovery? How do you think the REITs can impact the property market in terms of liquidity and price discovery? Um, I, I think um, since the collective investment, uh, you know, we, we can have uh, quite a number of even small players uh, coming in to invest. And um, because uh, the, 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 the shares are, especially if it's a listed, uh, you know, REIT, the, the shares can actually be publicly traded and uh, in that, you know, uh, there is um, uh, obviously price uh, establishment and analysts can easily infer uh, on the pricing of uh, the underlying asset. So it actually becomes easy because of that uh, public uh, trading. I think that's uh, the long and short of it. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. I will still be on you, uh, Darlington. Um, now, what role do you think REITs can play in attracting foreign investment into the Zimbabwe property market? Um, so, so you find that, um, I think I'll, I'll give a case in point of uh, the, uh, the, the EGO REIT. Um, it is basically a develop, development REIT. And um, in terms of its uh, portfolio mix, uh, it's actually a mixed uh, use um, uh, development rate. So we find that uh, in terms of uh, the use classes, uh, it is comprised of, um, uh, it's inclined towards uh, development of uh, tourism uh, stock. So there is a hotel, uh, there is a hospital, and other residential units, and these are basically uh, situated uh, in uh, in Victoria Falls, and uh, the intention is to then also list on the v VFX, and uh, in so doing, you also see that um, uh, should uh, I mean there is uh, opportunity for uh, foreign capital uh, to, to 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 also consider an investment in such a development uh, because of one its location. Uh, the underlying assets being resilient, 
and also the target return being in, um, in, in foreign currents. So it actually provides a, a resilient um, you know, offering, uh, also in the right color of, uh, of money, which obviously the, internal, I mean, the international community might be looking for. Yes, <laughs> interesting. Uh, anybody in short, uh, Chenge? Uh, actually, I want, just wanted to add on to what uh, um, Danington was talking about regarding um, the You've issue. Wanted, uh, 90 yeah. seconds. Well, I mean, yeah. So the, mm. one, one, one thing I like about REITs is that uh, I think as fund managers, one of the issues that we have been having problems with, uh, with our biggest client, uh, pension funds, is regarding the issue of valuation of properties. Sometimes we are um, accused of overvaluing properties so that we collect higher management fees. So with the coming in of REITs, it gives you a market-determined valuation because the, REIT, the, the, the price of the unit is market-determined. So when you now look at the total value, value of the property, it, it takes away the issue of subjectivity. Then the other issue, which is my last point regarding REITs, is that uh, in terms of attracting uh, capital, uh, property is generally regarded as illiquid. So REITs brings about, um, bring about a, an exit mechanism because they are listed. If someone brings in their money, they know that they can exit by just selling their units on the stock exchange rather than owning a proper property because when you want to exit now, there are so many things that you have to go through that uh, Stephen was talking about. But then this, when you are invested in a REIT, you are just selling your units on the exchange and you take your money and you go. Otherwise, thank you very much, uh, Mike, and thank you for the organizer, to the organizers uh, for this platform. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve, any parting shots? Uh, not much. I think we've said pretty much the same. Foot five um, seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you've taken... Yeah, but um, I, I think, Chenge, you've uh, touched uh, quite a, a bit on uh, the points that I also wanted to just... Um, Share, um, of course. The, I mean, one of the uh, maybe points that I would uh, mention is the tax advantages. You spoke a bit about it, but um, uh, I think in my previous life, um, that is in my previous work life before, uh, one of the battles that was there was, um, you know, I, I, this was a listed property company. Uh, and the challenge that we always used to have with, um, you know, investors was uh, they had to wait for us declaring a dividend, just like any other normal, you know, uh, entity. Uh, and, and the clamor was always around, look, we are invested in property. We want to benefit directly from the rentals that are being generated from the underlying assets. Uh, and I think this is one of the things that... Uh, REITs actually give you, you actually, you know, you benefit directly from the rent house itself, uh, the capital appreciation that is there, but also the tax advantage that comes with, uh, you know, that distribution. If you have certain tax exemptions, uh, you know, you are benefiting. I know it's something that you're still working on uh, and, and tweaking, but because as a REIT, you're having to just distribute the income and the entity then benefits from whatever tax advantages it has. So I think that's, that's also a, a major plus for REITs uh, and also that works positively for, for liquidity. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Chester? Um, nothing Mike, uh, much, Mike, except to thank the uh, conveners uh, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, at the opportunity of coming in front of these capital market developers uh, and speak to them as a builder and uh, find out how we can convert uh, bricklaying into uh, money instruments uh, that can uh, participate in uh, growing the economy. And thank you very much to the audience that has remained uh, awake after lunch and at the tail end of two days. Uh, you know, I was saying to my colleague, is there going to be anybody who for our session, they will all have driven back to Harare. Thank you very much. And interestingly, the house is still full. Everybody's awake. Yes, very much so. A round of applause to ourselves. Let's just leave it for ourselves. We are doing well. Darling, to your parting shots.
Uh, nothing much, but uh, just to say that um, I think going forward, uh, REITs will quite, quite be, I think, an important um, uh, vehicle uh, in capital raising for, 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 for major infrastructural projects. I think um, we, we should see more uh, REITs coming on board, especially to fill in the gaps uh, around housing and, uh, and infrastructure. Thank you. Th thank you, Darlington. Thank you all for being with us up to this hour of the day after two-day session. And we look forward to more listings of REITs. We look forward to you investing in property. Uh, the experts are right in front of you. We will do a very good, a very good job. And thanks to ZimInt for organizing and uh, ZSE and also uh, Secret Exchange Commission. Thank you.